I'm going to talk briefly about uh, a project that, I'm, that I've been thinking about, uh, and I also have not started this project, I should make that clear. Um, so this is very much in the planning phase and just trying to get ideas um, on, you know, is, is this a good project to pursue, is this the right way to pursue it, so on and so forth. Um, so if you've attended some of my talks throughout the summer, um, I apologize, I'm gonna, you're going to see some very uh, familiar slides as I provide kind of an, an overview of the stuff I've done so far because it's a necessary background to get to what I do next. So sorry if you've seen this, this sort of talk ad nauseum at this point, but it'll be quick, I promise. <laughs> Um, so overall, my main research interest has been summarized by this line here. How and why do organisms work together in groups? So for the past year or so, I've kind of focused more on, uh, on swarming, such as you know, these starlings here or the school of fish here, in response to predation. And so um, when we look through the literature, we know that a lot of animals, they, they work together in groups and they swarm as an anti-predator defense. right? Uh, so I've been interested in um, what are the specific benefits of working together in a group like this uh, against a predator. And so the unfortunate thing is, you know, we can go out and, and look in nature and, and observe the interactions between, say, the swarm of fish and the predators that are attacking it. Uh, but it's it's not impossible to do an actual evolution experiment where you start with the fish that don't do this, you know, put them in a lab and apply specific selection pressures, maybe even from another predatory fish, and see if this kind of behavior eventually evolves, right? So um, I've turned to <coughs> a digital system to do this instead, of course. I mean, that's what we do a lot here at Beacon, right? What we want to do um, evolution experiments, especially dealing with behavior. Um, and so here I simulate these little, uh, these little swarms. Well, actually, they're just groups of prey initially. They move randomly. That's little white dots, and then we have a little artificial predator. Um, and then each of them have their own little limited distance retina that they can observe the environment with. Um, that sensory information goes into an artificial brain that you can think of it as, that takes that information in and then makes a decision about where to move next. Right? Um, and so, at first, when we, when we put them, put random prey against the little predator, we see that the predator starts out fairly decent, and that's because I seed it with an okay predator because otherwise the predator just moves around randomly and it's boring to be able to watch. Um, but you see the prey, they just kind of move around randomly. They're like, ah, oh, help me, I'm trying to survive, I don't know what's going on, why am I dying? You know, they're, they're, try they're selected to survive as long as possible, and I, I promise you, they're not actually suffering like that. I'm just <laughs> giving them personality, <laughs> hopefully for entertainment. Um, <laughs> um, and so we start with kind of random behavior there. And so, uh, and what you'll see is that if I jump forward 100 generations, the first video was generation 1, the next video is generation 100, we see that we're, I'm actually evolving the behavior by evolving that little brain that processes the, the sensory information and makes some sort of movement decision. Right? Um, so, oops, yeah, it, so I mean this is just 100 generations, right? You know, they, they've gotten a little bit better, you see, in, in the time limit that the predator is allowed to feed on them. Um, they, some of the, they survive a little bit longer. And then if you go forward another 100 generations, you see they kind of maybe start to disperse now, just and they actually survive a bit longer because of this. Um, so I use digital models like this to test specific hypotheses in the literature about why uh, animals form swarms. And so the one that, uh, that I'm focusing on here for this project um, is one that we've I've actually talked here before about, uh, which is the, uh, the confusion effect theory. And so this was put forth by Molinsky in 1977, uh, the first time that he demonstrated it in an experiment um, where he claimed that denser groups of prey reduce predator attack efficiency. And he did this by putting a little stickleback into a fish tank with, with Daphnia. And he showed that if you just put you know, a few Daphnia or just one Daphnia in there, and let that and let the stickleback feed on it, it would have no problem capturing that that, that uh, daphnia. But if you put in increasingly large groups of daphnia, they would start to form these swarms as an anti-predator uh, defense, and then you would and then you would see that increasingly as the groups got larger, they would get they would form these larger swarms and it would be more and more confusing for the stickleback. It would actually start missing its attacks, or it would take longer to attack the swarm, or something like that. Um, and so he contributed this to the confusion effect, right? So, indeed, when I, when I take the model that I just showed you, 
and I put in a confusion effect, uh, we see that now we're at generation 1200 and the evolution there, we see that the prey actually do start to form these swarms. And also, you know, we did a control without this confusion effect and we see that they just disperse, right? So, so we see here that I have uh, this, this model that shows that it, at least it, how we've implemented it in this model, the confusion effect seems to provide a sufficient selection pressure for swarming behavior to evolve as an anti-predator defense. Um, so this has been fine and dandy. You know, I've done this several times with, with several other hypotheses where I'm sitting here, you know, model, model, model. And then typically how that works is we do it in the model and then we say, okay, biologists, now you go and take that model and, you know, take my predictions and do something with it with a biological, a biological experiment. Um, the difficulty is, is what I'm saying is, okay, go evolve, you know, go do, go evolve that big swarm of fish that I showed you a video of earlier, right? I already said the reason why I'm doing it in the model is because it's really hard to do in a biological system. So I was thinking about this and I was like, okay, well, so we have, uh, we have a model um, that, that, actually we have two models in the literature, one my own and then someone else who implemented the confusion effect in a similar experiment and showed that it provides a sufficient selection pressure. So we know that in, in models, it, it provides a sufficient selection pressure to select the swarm behavior. And we know that when we measure this, at least in, between sticklebacks and daphnia, that there appears to be some sort of confusion effect going on there, right? We have swarming daphnia, the sticklebacks feed on the swarming daphnia. So there, there still leaves open this question of, did the confusion effect, you know, that, that was caused by daphnia swarming, um, select for that swarming behavior in the first place, right? In this actual, in the actual biological system. Um, so what I'm wanting, wanting, wanting to get at here is to see um, will, will the predation from this guy actually select for swarming behavior, right? Um, so I was puzzled for this for a long time about how do we actually do this. And then uh, I saw a really neat paper in Science last year uh, that, that gave me a really great idea. And I think they were thinking about very similar things. So it was really neat to see this experiment um, where they took digital prey that they had been working with and that's these little dots here up on the screen, um, and they project them up on the side of a fish tank. So that's what we're looking into. We're looking at an actual fish tank here, and you see that they have a little fish come out, and they show that the fish actually readily interacts with these dots. Now, if you were at the, the Eve Colloquium talk last week, I actually misspoke. They do not train the fish to do this. The fish readily do this. They attack these dots just because they're so hungry. They basically can starve to the point that they will try to eat anything. And so, with this experiment, what they showed um, was that the, when they let the fish out, and they simulate, you know, some that swarm in groups, like up in the corner there, some that move off by themselves, and what they showed is that pretty clearly, the fish showed a very strong preference for attacking lone dots, right? So, they showed that, I, I believe the title of this was like, predatory, uh, well, I don't know the title. Um, they, basically, what they were trying to say here is that, the predator's preference for loner uh, prey could actually select for the swarming behavior. So I thought, oh wow, this is a really cool idea. You know, could I do the same thing and project my swarms up there and have my swarms co-evolve in response to predation from some kind of fish like this, right? So then I, I went around looking at the labs here on campus and I was like, okay, who has a fish lab? <laughs> who and who who will actually respond to my email? Uh, <laughs> And, and it turns out, uh, Jenny Bauman was more than happy to host this kind of experiment, um, at least in theory, as long as we get the funding for it. Um, and so it, and it actually worked out really perfectly because she has sticklebacks in the lab, right? And if you remember, the study that I was just talking about where they originally measured the confusion effect was with sticklebacks and daphnia. Daphnia aren't easy enough to get. Um, I've heard you can buy them in mass dried and you can make thousands or however many they are in the little vat quite easily. Um, so it's easy to get our hands on Daphne as well. Um, so what I was thinking was it would be really great um, if we could set up something like this in Jenny's lab and say have, um, I mean this has multiple sticklebacks in there, but we'd have a single stickleback in there and then we would project my swarms up onto the side of the fish tank and say we do like a 30 minute trial. Um, we videotape each trial and watch which ones the predator uh, uh, pecks at the most, right? 
And then the fitness, so normally the fitness is determined by how long the prey survived in my simulations, but the fitness here could be um, how often they get attacked, right? How, how often each individual prey gets attacked, where the less they get attacked, the higher their fitness is, and thus the more they reproduce into the next generation. And so I think it'd be really, I think we can do all kinds of neat experiments with this. Like, I could even just take my evolved swarms and see, you know, I have swarms at generation 200 that don't really do much. I have swarms at generation 800 that maybe swarm a little bit, and I have swarms at later generations that swarm a lot. And so just an initial experiment, I could project those up and see, do I see the same effect um, as, as with the actual stickleback and Daphne experiments, right? You know, do my, over evolutionary time, does the confusion effect seem to be causing them to attack less or something like that? Good question about that. Yeah, so how would you, do they get eliminated if they get attacked? I mean, in your sim original simulation, you got selection there, but right. you, here you, you don't have selection directly, right? I, I mean, so that, that's another thing that would require kind of more setup on the experiment, because then I would have to actually watch, watch the video in real time, find out which one they attacked and remove it, but that's certainly feasible. Um, what so I was thinking would even be automated. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to make it automated that way. Um, the way I was proposing was just to watch how many times the fish pecked at each one, and then basically it gets you know minus one fitness point, if you will, each time it gets pecked at. Um, I mean, so this is something that I need feedback on: is what's the best? You know, I'm trying to find a good way to make my simulation or my model and the actual biological org organism interact. And I think designing a proper uh, way to have them interact is going to be the core point, the core point of this experiment. Um, so this is my last slide, um, where I openly say I need feedback and ideas on this. Um, if you have any thoughts, um, so you know, of course, I went to Sticklebacks and Daphnia because we one we have the lab on campus, it's right down the road. Um, there's precedence in the literature to follow this kind of experiment. Um, but maybe are there different biological systems, not even fish, maybe, I mean, you know, um, gosh, what's the other experiment where they had, what was it, hawks, or not hawks, but pigeons or something like that, attacking um, fake butterflies? Blue, 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 blue jays, there you go. Yeah, they had blue jays, I mean, maybe so many birds, I don't, I don't know. I mean, what, would there be a better biological system to look at this kind of thing? Um, is this the appropriate setup for that? I mean, now, this is this is one that's now been, that, that seems to work and it seems to work well. But maybe there's a better way to make uh, the the digital prey and the predators interact, uh, or even what other hypotheses can be explored. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of focused in more on the hypotheses that I've been interested in. But could this, this could this kind of system be used to explore other ideas or other hypotheses? Um, and then so. <laughs> I submitted this for, for a beacon ground last year, and I got slammed really hard for saying this is, a, this is not cross-institutional. And so I, I absolutely agree that if we're going to get beacon funding, we should include the other institutions. My problem is I don't know of any other labs to do this at. So if you know people that would be interested in doing this kind of experiment, especially if they have a, like a fish lab, like I'm ready to hop in and do this in a fish lab, I would be more than happy to hear about them and meet them to talk about this. Um, so with that, I'm... Happy to take questions and hear ideas. So, um, I have a couple questions for Maya. Oh, okay, sure. Yes, please. So, for, first of all, there's a guy here named Barry Robeson who does work on the genet genomics of zebra fish behavior. Zebra fish, okay. And he, he ch zebra fish, not the fish. Fish. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Daniel Raria. If you put the fishes in his tanks, they would drown. <laughs> so Good what he does is he, uh, he, he, the fish adapt to the presence of a human, and they lose the startle response when you startle them. And then he takes the brains and he looks at the genomics of how that startle response was uh, was created and it has something to do with sync. I don't know, but you might want to contact Barry. Okay, great, great. Right. And, and the second question I have, I mean, the question I have, okay. how are you evolving the prey again? What, what's what's the mechanism by which you're evolving the prey? Yeah, so I'm I'm using a genetic algorithm to evolve the prey, and so in in um, 
Are, are, now, are you talking about in my proposed system, or are you talking about in what I've done modeled already? In that, what do you think is the right way to evolve those prey? And, and if it's a genetic algorithm, a genetic algorithm that does what? It's got move left, move right. Um, I'm wondering what sort of evolutionary computation you're actually thinking would work. Right, so I have... I have the reason I ask is, the reason I... Risto has done some wonderful stuff on the evolution of motion. If you need anything as sophisticated as what he's got. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I have, I have a population of, of these brains, if you will, that control each individual prey. Um, and so, typically in my model, um, you know, with the genetic algorithm, just the longer each genome or each brain survives, the more likely that one is to reproduce into the next generation, right? And just following the evolutionary process, you know, when it makes an offspring in the next generation, we apply mutation and yada, yada, yada. Um, so that's how we use a, a genetic algorithm to sort of evolve the behavior. Um, yeah. But I don't think I'm being clear. I, I know how genetic algorithms work. What I'm asking is, what does this brain do? What does it look like? What are the, what are the, what are the genes in your genetic algorithm? Right, so the genes are just strings of numbers, and they're, they're transferred. Are, are you familiar with like artificial neural networks? I mean, I, I risk to use them a lot. I think he wants to know what the behaviors oh, are. He so said, like, turn left and right, right, right to go to towards oh, somebody, yeah, go over the right turn, right turn, left turn, right turn. Right, right yeah, so they, I mean, the, the brain is basically mapping the sensory information, you know, so whatever, whatever it sees, in this case, it, it, all it's going to be able to see is the other prey that are being projected. It won't actually be able to see the predator, at least in the first iteration. Um, and then, based off of that sensory information, it, it can make some sort of decision. It can move forward, move left, move right, or just stand still if it really doesn't care about anything anymore. Um, so that's, that's basically what we're evolving, is that, um, that, that controller in, in the middle between the sensory and the, and the motor loop. So I have a prediction that you're going to evolve blind fish. Yeah, they're not going to pay any attention to this. I'm sort of joking, but if you think about the selection on the fish, and this, again, I think what both of these are struggling with is to get sort of a two-way feedback. I mean, the, the time scales are very different, but in some sense, the fish are going to learn, are going to evolve to, or maybe even learn, but uh, on another time scale, to ignore this game that's being played on them. Um, and so it strikes me that if you could think of, it, if you or Rohan or anybody could think of one that involved a faster evolving Biologic, so he had the fast evolving biological system, say with the micro, but if you could get that where you've got something more commensurate on the two time scales, you really make them co-evolutionary would be really cool. So I don't know exactly how to do that, but I'd love to think more about it. I mean, with this experiment, I was actually kind of hoping to keep the predator fixed. Uh, to have a, I mean, to, to even eliminate learning if I could by using different fish each trial or something like that. That's what Jamie suggested. Yeah, that so was, like, yeah they'll figure this out, so yeah, we'll just right. rotate. You're fishing. <laughs> but at one level, then you're. So that's perfectly fine for testing very specific hypotheses, yes. but sort of at least part of what I got from Rohan, Rohan's was that there's sort of a deeper idea of kind of setting up co evolving right. systems, cool. whereas this is more just a mixed test of between a thing, slightly different goal. I think the learning might bring some of that in if you actually did explicitly. So if you offered rewards for certain types of behaviors on the fish. Right. Yeah. And, you, and I think actually even if you don't do that, a really nice control on this would be to flip your, your fitnesses. So in other words, start instead of this being eaten when a fish touches it, it's being fed. Mm -hmm. like, and, and it's a higher fitness. So, so see whether or not you actually completely flip the behavior. And you can't yeah. Yeah. Could, could you evolve type of behavior that is actually exciting for the fish? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Which would be actually the parasite that controls the fish brain that needs to get into the fish for the uh, 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 I'm not to inject Markov brands into fish. The parasite that you hear is from North Carolina. So we had a question in North Carolina. Go ahead. Yes, please, please go ahead. Okay, so you actually define your fitness on like how often you get attacked by the predator, right? Yes. So now when you consider the narrow field of vision of the predator fish, do you uh, have you consider maybe the survival rate, some uh, the survival rate of a school, and in that case you could use the one of the metrics for the different schools, you could use the spatial distribution against the survival rate after an attack. Because when you only consider 
how often you get attacked, then you might also want to consider if they are actually being seen by the predator. Because earlier you see that the predator will only see the school that are in low number. And you also talked about the density. And fish do have that dilution effect that they use to escape predator. One of the reasons why they live in group. Mm -hmm. So it might shape the way they do escape when they have a predator around. So this is just a suggestion that you might want to consider the, the spatial distribution, how dense they are, and also how they survive after a predator attack as a way to quantify their fitness. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I think, I think so, so you're talking about to see if the predator actually accurately attacked the prey, like, you know, pecked right on the dot or something, uh, and, and, or, or if it's limited in seeing the whole population, if it, if it can only focus in on this one prey, that's what it's focusing in on, it's not taking an opportunity to go to anything. Right. Exactly, not just about the attack, because in order to be attacked, it has to be seen by the predator. Yes. Now, one school might not be attacked because the predator did not even see the school, ah. and then you will give them a higher fitness, meanwhile, they might not deserve that. I see, I see. So I, like just by hiding in the corner or something like that. I mean, so that that absolutely that's that's definitely a good um, concern to raise because actually, if I, if I go back to the videos of the previous system, we'll go back there. Um, let's see if this video will play. So, I mean, what the funny little fluke here is that they had the simulation roll over with how they display the prey. So you see the prey flickers in over here and then, and then flickers over to the other side. And some fish, as that video just showed, actually preferred these groups that were on the side there. So they got attacked more simply because of their spatial distribution there. So that's actually a really good point to bring up. Go back to the beginning, the middle-ish part of the video. It, yeah. You're seeing the fish attack the single prey. Yeah. It's going to attack that over and over again. It's not going to see that one. Right. I think that. I think that's where really it's getting at. Mm -hmm. Well, then, but I. What would that be a good thing though if we want to see selection for swarming behavior? Except those aren't independent events, right? Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, but maybe it's just to keep attacking it because, you know, it's not succeeding. It's still there, so it attacks again. It's still there, so it keeps attacking it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you eliminate it, once it attacks it, then it would go somewhere else to, to eat something else. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that we do know that uh, predators that have a very uh, limited field of vision, you know, in fact, will not really easily get confused. Um, so I think Jenny had also suggested that there are two different uh, types of fish that have different uh, you know, visual fields and one could test you know, whether indeed you know, the angle of your visual field does affect the, uh, uh, the, the response to, to, to the response. Right. Well, isn't that kind of what the, can I interrupt for a second, isn't that what the Lions and Antelope Project that Jerry Soule was doing, isn't that what he was doing? I believe that was part of it, right? Yeah, is that the one where there was like a, a leader lion or something? And I remember seeing a beacon talk on this before. Yeah, that was, that was Terry. So I think the other side of this is at least started to be explored in Beacon. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe there's your answer. Do we can partnership with someone who's exploring the evolution of the predator? Right. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, so the, I, mean, I think that's absolutely an interesting thing to, um, to explore in a model like this. The difficulty, of course, 
is that the interaction between uh, the digital system and the biological system becomes much more complex, right? Because then you actually have to process the video in real time to see where the predator, or, or to, see, to show what exactly you're feeding into the predator's visual field, right? Um, so I know, um, actually, at this lab where, where they publish this project, they actually are working on something like that. Um, but thus far, all I've gotten from the guys developing that is, yeah, it's going to be really cool. <laughs> and no, you're not welcome to come and use it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, a different kind of question. Um, so you're only evolving brains, yes? Right. So is, is that, is, has anybody ever done anything about uh, evolving brains together with other morphological traits? I'm wondering how, how realistic it is that, that that it's just brain evolution, not the best because their behavior is fixed. Yeah, yeah, because their behavior depends on their physiology and morphology and so on as well. Right? So maybe, I mean, two easy examples to pursue. At least sound easy would be the size of the dot, yeah. uh, the individual dot, and the other would be the speed with which they're moving, which presumably yeah. you constrain. So it might be interesting to uh, play around with something where you have multiple degrees of freedom there. I like that idea. I'm going to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> but then are you testing individual aspects of whatever these predators are? Do you want to get at uh, answers to these theories that would be uh, universal to swarming behavior and predators, right? Right. I feel like and all of these I experiments are hardcore predator specific. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, the idea with this experiment is we try to model our dots to match Daphnia as, as closely as possible. Even, you know, the, the light that we uh, project up onto the fish tank, we're going to try to match it to the, the color is this. Uh, we might very well have to change it to a different color that the fish actually interact with. That we know. Or, or evolve the color. Yeah, or evolve the color. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, that's why I'm writing this down. I, I, don't, I, think, I think that might model um, the experiment where we want to test a specific hypothesis, like the confusion effect hypothesis, because suddenly they might just evolve a color where they can't be seen on the fish tank anymore. And that's, that doesn't get at the predator confusion hypothesis at all. Right? Like it's a, a different kind of theory or something like that. But I think it's a really cool idea as I'm taking it. Uh, if you want to make sure they can be seen, you can evolve the color in the control experiment mm -hmm. that Ben suggested, right. where they want to be eaten, see what color they become, you unlock in that color for the other thing. Aloha, again. Yep. Okay. How familiar are we with the mathematical model of fish schooling behavior? Um, I'm fairly familiar. Are, are you talking? Which one are you talking about? The Reynolds or the, the Vizek model or which one? Like, are you familiar with the, the zone of attraction, repulsion? Yes. yes. Yeah. The, and, the points. Yes. Okay. So, did you build such? concept into your model uh, from the fish schooling perspective? No, so um, the original experiment that I was showing there from, from the other lab that was published in science last year, that one used those, uh, used those equations to control where the dots move. Here we're actually, uh, we're not programming any sort of rules like that into the model. Instead we're evolving that brain and so that evolves whatever kind of rule, I mean, you know, whatever evolution discovers um, to control the each, each agent. Okay. The reason why I ask is because since you are using a brain, having something like that could allow you to evolve along, let's say, those dimensions. It's like when a school notices that the higher my zone of attraction to the other fish, it helps me to be safer, then I'm just going to keep that safer distance. I'm going to increase it, I'm going to decrease it. Mm -hmm. So building some rules like that can help you further refine your ordinary algorithm in terms of the lines along which you can uh, generate your evolution, you can right. control your evolution. Right, it'll sort of guide the evolution towards these kinds of rules. Um, that's um, definitely true, I mean, and that's actually a consideration because it could be, I mean, it, it usually takes about a thousand generations to evolve the brains um, to evolve the swarming behavior, but I mean, perhaps 
using perhaps evolving the rules like that could provide could provide a sort of directed evolution to make the experiment faster. Because of course, if each trial takes 30 minutes and we're talking hundreds of generations, we're talking a very long experiment here. So yes, absolutely, we could potentially evolve those rules instead. Yeah. Question, just out of curiosity. Uh, what kind of fish does Jenny have? Are they lab strings or wild type or um, so my what fish are you using? My, my understanding is that the sticklebacks she has are um, mostly lab bred at this point, though there is the possibility, I've been told, um, to bring in wild caught ones, um, which I, I would have a bias, I am, as a computer scientist, I would have a bias towards uh, wild caught ones. <laughs> Um, simply because those are the ones that are actually interacting with Daphne out there in the wild, probably. <laughs> Virtually all of hers are actually wild caught. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I yeah so they have a very small number that they try to bring okay. just have so, available, but virtually everything is extracted from the wild. Really? Okay, because yes. last week Jason told me that most of them were lab bred, but... I guess Aren't some of them, them, what do you mean by lab bred? They're raised in the lab. They're raised in the lab. They're, they're, they're yeah. taken from the they're recent okay. isolates, and they'd be different, you know, they'd be these benthic and limnetic forms okay. from different lakes. And right. So they don't have direct experiences. That's true. Right. So they're not domesticated in that sense. So they're wild type, but they have been right. reared. They're genetically it. wild, but perhaps not behavioral. Exactly. Okay. Yes. That's right. right. Okay, yeah. So maybe, maybe that's what he is getting at. Yeah. Uh, yes. Any, uh, any other comments, suggestions? Out, out there ideas, those are definitely welcome. I want we do this all out in space. <laughs> as soon as NASA opens up again. <laughs> and uh, the technology to do that is actually pretty cheap. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is all the stuff that's you know, no special purpose. And this is, if, if you notice, this is actually my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> and the projector is a standard projector, and then the films, you know, uh, so, so this lab has already figured out what is the best film to project this on, so, you know, we know where, where we want it, but we don't. Is there a market for fish entertainment? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you could imagine that, selling this system to people for right? yeah, yeah, watch it. I imagine that. Yeah. That's a good idea. Watch it. Yeah, yeah. 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 fish cool. Yeah. Yeah. You can also do yeah. 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 it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.